Greetings from Austin, Texas. My name is Victoria de Francesco Soto. I am the Assistant Dean of Civic Engagement here at the LBJ School. Welcome to TripFest this year, 2020. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to this fantastic panel. I'm a little biased, but this is probably going to be one of the best panels of the TripFest, Why the Latinx Vote Matters. And we are joined today by two of the foremost women in the in the trenches looking at the Latinx vote and its mobilization. We have Maria Teresa Kumar, founding president of Voto Latino, as well as Crystal Cermeño, uh, political director for the Texas Organizing Project. Welcome, amigas. Thank you. Nice to be here, Christine. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I want to start with the big picture. Uh, I want to get a lay of the land, and then we can start zooming in to what's what's going on right now. But Maria Teresa, I, I wanted to start with you with the big picture national landscape of what the Latino electorate looks like in terms of its numbers. And also, if you can give us a little bit of a historical context of how the Latino electorate nationally at the aggregate has been evolving in, I would say, the last you know three or four electoral cycles. And then, Crystal, I want to turn to you to get a real deep dive into the evolution of the Latino electorate in the last several election cycles here in the Lone Star State as well. So, Maria Teresa. Thank you, for, so first of all, for having this conversation and for including Voto Latino. We couldn't be more pleased than to share the platform with the Texas Organizing Project. Thanks for the work that you all do. Uh, so a couple of things that uh, we started Voto Latino 15 years ago, and we started it with this idea that if we targeted young Latinos, that they have an outside influence in their families long before they turn 18 years old. And if we can get them involved in politics, then we can go ahead and target their families through them. We, uh, for all intents and purposes, right after the 2010 census, we saw that Latinos were going to become the second largest voting bloc this election. Uh, we weren't the only ones. When we talk about voter suppression that happened right after the gutting of the Voting Rights Act in 23, uh, 2013 from uh, Shelby County versus Eric Holder, it was because people saw the same math. And so for the very first time, uh, Victoria, we're going to see the Latinos actually realize the ability to be the second largest voting bloc because of our demographic. We are disproportionately young. Of the majority of Americans, while the majority of Americans, the most frequent age that pops up among whites is 58, the most common age among Latinos, and you're sitting down, is 11 years old. We're very, very, very young. And for the very first time, we have a wave of Latinos turning uh, 18 every single year to the tune of a million individuals. That tsunami of Latinos turning 18 every single year started in 2016, and 4 million of them will be eligible to vote this com coming this election in a presidential for the first time. And we don't expect that tsunami to settle for another decade. So there's going to be a lot of us really fast. And so our purpose at Voto Latino is to register voters as quickly as possible, because when people say that Latinos don't vote, that's not the case. Our biggest challenge in the Latino community is actually closing the voter registration gap. We have 32 million Latinos who are eligible to vote. Half of us are registered and 79% of us are willing to go to the polls. The other half of us, 15 million of us, are not registered. And as I shared with you, of the 15 million, 10 million of us are under the age of 33, 4 million of us who are gonna be eligible to cast a ballot for the first time. Sadly, in the last two presidential elections, 49% of registered Latino voters never received a contact from a political party or from a candidate. And that, as Crystal can speak to, is oftentimes because we don't have a history of voting. And the way traditional pol power politics plays is that candidates and political parties go after people who have a history of voting. But if we are a young population with no history of voting or maybe have only voted once, we won't get a contact. And if our parents are naturalized citizens, we may not get a contact because we don't have a history of voting. For the very first time, Victoria, we are going to have one in 10 eligible voters are going to be naturalized citizens. That's also historic. So our job at Voto Latino is to register as many people as possible in time for the 20, uh, 2020 election. I'm pleased to say that as of this morning, Voto Latino has registered 299,000 registered voters. 
and 160, and I have to give you the right number. And, and this, in this cycle of those 299,000, 164,671 are from Texas. And that is because I deeply believe that Texas is going to turn blue with the help of folks like Crystal's organization, though, with the help of Maldef, with the help of all these other organizations that we are going to turn blue this year because the Latino community, we are paying attention and we have so much skin in the game that we're not going to go any other way. We're not going to turn back history. We're going to move forward. And Maria Teresa, you've you've been saying this for a while. You're not suddenly saying, oh, Texas is going to go blue. I'm seeing the polls, you know, neck and neck. I mean, you have been out here proselytizing, saying Texas is going to go blue. Texas is going to go blue because it's a slow and steady race. There is this youth out there. They're coming of age. If you're able to connect with them, this is where it is at. So And and you're hitting. Yeah, no, you're hitting. Yeah, sorry. Go ahead. (laughs) I just get excited with Texas, like, Crystal. I, de- Texas, I deeply it, believe in Texas. You guys are going to turn blue, <laughs> and it's going to be despite what everybody else is saying, Crystal. So <laughs> We're in the mix. Texas is no longer that kind of deep red place that folks ignore. No. We are deep in the mix. And, Crystal, I know that the Texas Organizing Project has been in our neighborhoods, has been on the streets of Texas, talking to people, engaging with people, Give us give us a little bit of that historical sense of what you've seen over the last several years that brings us to this point where we're a battleground now. Yeah, well, first, I'm honored to be here with Maria Teresa and just so thankful for the work that they've been doing, you know, for the last ex- really long period of time of registering folks. Ten and really years. Putting us up on the national stage. <laughs> I know. I feel like it's been longer than 10 years. <laughs> well, no, we've been in Texas um, for 10 years because I, I, I believe yeah, in you guys. Sorry. <laughs> sure. Yeah, no. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's that's our story, right? Is um, we've been around for 10 years. Um, and when I first came on board to the Texas Organizing Project, we really asked this question of who isn't voting, right? I mean, I think mm-hmm. as Maria Teresa said, the typical question that folks ask is, is who are those persuadable voters that we need to move in which direction? And really fundamentally in Texas, what we were seeing is that people were really just kind of tapping out of elections. Um, And instead of investing and really getting folks to engage in the process, they were just skipping over us. Um, And we used to call them kind of vote deserts. You could literally walk through Mm -hmm. a Latino neighborhood and there was no sign. There was no mail going to, to folks. Um, my parents are frequent voters and, you know, they rarely get any kind of mail from a presidential candidate in a general election in Texas. And so, you know, we like to say that we um, fight with two fix, fists at Texas Organizing Project. Um, we do year-round organizing And then we also couple that with politics because fundamentally we are about changing the lives of Black and Latino folks in the state of Texas. And we know that the only way to do that is by really engaging in politics and fighting for policies that are going to fundamentally change our daily lives. Um, And so, you know, as we started sort of untangling the research and really understanding what was happening or rather what was not happening um, in our communities, Um, we really started to put much more focus and energy into getting out the vote. And just to kind of look at the big picture, right? By 2022, uh, Latinos will be the largest population in the state of Texas. Right now, Mm -hmm. we have 4 million registered voters. And that is more registered voters than the whole state of Arizona. Registered Latino Mm -hmm. voters, sorry. More than the state of Arizona and more than 19 other states of all their registered voters. So the stakes have always been high in Texas and we've always seen that horizon um, of Democrat, of Latino um, population growth and that coupled with other communities of color. And so we started investing really early and really engaging in conversations. I mean, what, what our folks have said to us time and time again is that they don't see themselves as part of the process that they really don't see um, their policies reflected in what is being pushed both at the state level and even at the local level. And so, you know, we, our program is really about building relationships on the doors um, and having deep conversations. When we knock on a door, the first thing we ask people is, what do you care about? 
What are the issues in your neighborhood? What are the issues that you're facing in your family? And then we connect those issues to the importance of voting. And then we follow through. We don't just have this transactional relationship that goes away after the election. We come back around and we say, let's join, join us in this fight, right? Let's join in this fight together and hold our elected op- officials accountable and help our champions fight for our cause. And then it's got to be a long-term investment, right? I mean, we have to be investing in these kinds of relationships, the Voto Latinos, the Texas Organizing Projects, the Luchas in Arizona, the New Florida Majority, who are engaged in these conversations with folks every day around fights that are extremely important to them and their families. And we have to deliver change. We have to build communities of voting. And we have to build that sort of muscle of... Um, uh, in our in our families and in our communities. And Crystal, and I want to point out that while all eyes are on Texas and the presidential race and how we're a battleground, there have been some really important changes at the state level. So we saw in 2018 uh, a number of very important House legislative seats flip. So you see that there's also movement at the subnational level here in Texas, in our communities. Uh, you know, suburbs are also changing as well. So for folks outside of Texas who may not dig down, understanding that the level of change is really happening uh, at multiple levels. So I, I want to talk about the mobilizing efforts of both of your organizations, but in the context of the COVID-19 pandemic. You know, Maria Teresa, I know that Voto Latino is out there. You know, you are one of the organizations that does the best job of connecting with the youth. Your 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 conference is one of the marquee events of the year. You bring together a bunch of young people. You energize them. You're out at festivals. But how how are we doing it now in this age of COVID nineteen? That's a great question, Victoria. I think that what the a lot of the programs that you mentioned, it was it's really a way for us to be in the community when we're not online. Uh, Voto Latino started as a digital first organization, but very similar to what Crystal was saying is that we're in agreement that the only way you get a young person excited about participation is that you have to meet them where they are, whether it's online or on the ground, and you have to talk to them about the issues they care about. I think oftentimes what happens in in organizing in the Latino community that it's not coming from the Latino community. These are outside actors. They kind of shove a voter registration form in your face and you want to participate, not realizing that for many of us, the moment we want step outside our door, our government isn't working for us. We have broken schools. We don't have people dumping up our garbage. We have little, uh, little resources. And so our job is to convince them that government matters when they participate and it's identifying the issues they care about. And we have these conversations with our audience all the time on digital. Uh, Going into the COVID pandemic, uh, we basically were reaching roughly 8.5 million people a month across our social platforms. The moment COVID hit, we started talking to people about real conversations of what happens if they can't access sexual reproductive uh, services. We brought in Alexis McGill from Planned Parenthood, and we had a very frank conversation about how do you do that? Because as Latinas, we don't like to have those conversations, but we were seeing people trending and asking questions. Uh, We started talking about the fact that 20% of the Latino workforce didn't qualify for the CARES Act because we were either, you know, legal U.S. citizens, but didn't have, but we had undocumented loved ones in our households. How do you actually access resources for that? And then we had uh, very frank conversations, uh, sadly, around the death of George Floyd. And with what happened with the the death of George Floyd, from our experience, we knew that policing, even though no one talks about it, was a huge issue among young Latinos. Because sadly, at, even though African Americans lead in the death, our community is not far behind in those policing issues. And we only knew that because we had been surveying our audience. They were participating. Part they participated in uh, President Obama's 21st Century Policing Task Force, and so we were able to pivot all of the conversations we were having online and our voter registration efforts, um, Victoria, from just regular voter registration to connecting protest to voting. We expected to register roughly about 21,000 people in the month of June. By June 21st, we had registered 22,000. I'm sorry, by, I'm sorry, by June 3rd, we had registered 22,000. By the end of June, we had registered over 87,000. And the majority of them 
were from Texas. And 80% of the people we registered in Texas were under the age of 33 and 75% of them. But it's because to uh, Crystal's point, we don't parachute into our community and out. No, we have a constant dialogue with them. We are on their pulse. And people say, well, who's Voto Latino? I said, Voto Latino is we are the people we serve. And that's why when we have folks like Crystal in these positions and we have we talk about Lucha and we talk about the, the organizing project in Florida, it's so important to have people who have skin in the game create the strategy and speak to our community because we recognize that that is how we connect. And so in the age of COVID, we've actually had to help close the gap for a lot of organizations that are site-based. And so we are working very closely in Florida uh, to help do that because our stuff is digital. Um, and so one of the things that, you know, Crystal was talking about how they're going more digital. I'm like, we have to get offline because we can talk to you about how, we, how we've done that because we've built a lot of the technology expecting a very different scenario. But with this understanding that relational organizing, peer-to-peer conversations, that's the most important. Since COVID, we've trained over uh, 5,000 individuals. Uh, we've clocked in over 2,700 uh, volunteer hours. And we've actually had conversations with eight, over 800,000 low propensity voters all from the comfort of people's living rooms, uh, but talking about the issues they care about, whether it is policing, whether it is abortion care, whether it's filling out the census, whether do you have your vote by mail ballot, but again, meeting them where they are so that they feel comfortable asking us the real substance of questions that may hold them back otherwise. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And, and Voto Latino, I mean, you guys have always been digital. You were essentially digital native. Mm-hmm. So I can see where that pivot would be a little bit more fluid. Now, mm-hmm. Crystal, in, in also talking about mobilization and connecting in the, in the time of COVID, I wanted to talk about um, the Valley. So all eyes, both in Texas and nationally, have been on the catastrophic rates of COVID-19 infection and death rates in the Valley. How are you seeing that uh, affect the Latino community in terms of mobilizing them? Is this lighting a fire under people or or do you see so uh, so much angst, so much apathy perhaps at, at the result that we're dealing with life and in the death of our loved ones? What are you seeing down in the valley? Well, I, I have to be frank in that we don't, um, the valley has not been a traditional geography that we've been um, organizing mm-hmm. over the last um, five years. We did actually early on and have been um, doing some work statewide as we've been engaging digitally. Um, And so having much more, many more conversations with folks. And I think actually the story is not very different. When you look at the Valley and you look at the Latinos that we're talking to in Houston and in Dallas and in San Antonio, right? Our folks are being impacted at much higher rates. And I think Mm -hmm. for us, this is, for us and for our communities, um, this is a breakthrough moment. This is the story that we've been telling and now it's exposed raw, both the social injustice that's been happening and then the economic injustice and the fact that there is no safety net for our folks, either on healthcare because there's been no healthcare Medicaid expansion in the state of Texas and no real access, no access to good jobs that provide the healthcare Mm -hmm. or provide the wages where you can actually you know, have some kind of safety net to be able to stay in your home or stay in your apartment in the middle of this pandemic. And so I think, you know, I think this is reflected in what we're seeing in some of the polling that's coming out on where Latinos are standing on both candidates um, and on the election is that, you know, we're kind of tired (laughs) and nobody is really speaking to those needs. And that's what we're finding. Um, You know, we've had to pivot as an organization that is really door knocking on the ground, sitting on people's couches, inviting folks into our space for meetings and events and actions. Um, It's been really, um, you know, it was scary at first, but we pivoted very quickly, our organizers, our leaders, to um, sitting in that space um, and learning from each other so that we can start having real two-way conversations, which are critically important to us. And so, um, you know, in the summer when we were facing the pandemic and then on top of it, George Floyd and all of the unrest, you know, we saw spikes of folks engaging with us as we sat down with district attorneys, our local district attorneys that are progressive and have been fighting on issues and also lines of defense for some of our folks in the community 
we've got an opportunity in this election to reelect some of those people, to elect some new progressive leaders. Um, and it's black and brown folk both engaging in these conversations. As Maria Teresa pointed out, you know, our folks in Texas, um, Latinos, are facing a lot of, um, you know, discrimination in their communities by the police. When SB4 passed, you know, we took a quick poll with folks and what was resonating with them was this show me your papers, we're all going to be racially profiled because we are every day in our state. So, um, Mm -hmm. so I think what we're, you know, what we're seeing are um, real opportunities to have those conversations. And I think what we have to continue to keep demanding is that they listen to us, right? That, um, that Joe Biden listens to us, <laughs> that the Democratic Party listens to us, and why we're not feeling the energy is because we need to hear people speaking out and fighting aggressively on healthcare for all, on college opportunities, on these safety nets, on better jobs and wages and protecting us from evictions. And Crystal, and, and to that point of, of, of needing that energy from the Democratic Party, from the Biden campaign, uh, we're less than two months away from the election. And there have been some recent polls that show that there might be that gap of enthusiasm among some segments of the Latino community, uh, even though this isn't about Florida, but Florida has been something that's been in the news recently. In Nevada, even though there's still very strong support, uh, you see Trump making tiny bits of inroads here and there. Maria Teresa, how do you see the Trump factor in all of this? We, We know that Trump has invested money into the Latino community. He really didn't do so last time around, but this time, he has the Latino community in his sights. Are we seeing any substantive advancement by the Trump campaign? And at the same time, what is it that the that the Biden Democratic campaign needs to do to get them to where they were four years ago? Yeah. I have to share with you that my biggest concern of how Trump is making inwards in the Latino community is on nobody's radar. It is not an advertising that we see on TV. It's not an advertising that we see on television, on uh, in print or on radio. It is all the inroads of chipping away, of talking to the Latino community through each other, sharing information that is not accurate through our WhatsApp and through our Facebook. When we hear people parroting social socialism, that uh, that's why they they don't want that to be in this country. That they left. Uh, communism, and that's what they don't want this in this country. Those are literally parroting talking points and advertising that both the Latinos started detecting over two years ago. But it's clearly making headway because we now hear Latinos for Trump who are saying for the first time that they're politically engaged, parroting misinformation and disinformation. And what has happened it goes back to what Crystal was underlining and what we deeply believe in Voto Latino is that you can't talk to Latinos every four years. Trump never start, stopped talking to the Latino community through Facebook or through WhatsApp. And we have to be much more sophisticated that in absence of that vacuum of information, someone will fill it, even if they are nefarious actors. I'll give you an example of nefarious conversations, right? After the 2016 election, when they said that there were foreign actors interfering in our elections, we were able to see some of the ads that targeted Latino communities on Facebook. It was a picture of Hillary Clinton that said, encouraging to vote for her, but not to stand in line. That instead you can text your vote in. That is not accurate and that is not true. But our community, because we're so new to the process, we don't know. So if you were to ask me, the biggest thing that I'm concerned with is that a lot of the misinformation that we started seeing in in Florida about 18 months ago is starting now to appear into the feeds of Texans. I encourage everybody watching this not to retreat a headline without double clicking and make sure that it's true. Make sure that you're sharing information that's accurate because the reason they target our community disproportionately is that most of us speak English There's no news outlet that speaks to us, but we're hungry for information to navigate the country for ourselves and for our families. And so people are using that as an opportunity to go after the community and split us up and balkanize us in many ways. So for example, what should Joe Biden be talking about? When when you hear President Trump saying that he's going to cut the payroll tax, that should be code red for so many of us. 
because that means that he's going to cut social security from our moms and our dads, and he's going to cut Medicare. Medicare and social security are the lifelines of retirement for our communities. We don't have a plan B. We don't have independent stock markets or wealth accounts. And so we have to be very clear that there are two different types of America. And under one, the Latino community has felt an incredible level of anxiety that we have never experienced in our lifetime. And it will continue being chipped away at if we don't make sure that we course correct and bring Joe Biden and make him talk about student loans, make him talk about Medicare for all. At least there we have a seat at the table and we have a fighting chance to get the stuff that we need and the resources we need for our community. So we have just a couple of minutes left. And, and, and Crystal, before we go, I want to dig into the infrastructure, the nuts and bolts of voting here in Texas. Uh, just today, there was a headline that Harris County in Houston is going to go ahead and send mail-in ballots to everyone, even though it was previously blocked by a judge. We're seeing a lot of back and forth between what uh, large communities want to do, the big cities, Dallas, San Antonio, Austin, and what Greg Abbott and, and you know, folks at the legislature want to have. What are we seeing in terms of the registrars, in terms of county by county? Are they ready for election day, for early election, for the back and forth between whether or not we're going to have mail-in balloting or in, in working throughout Texas? What are you seeing in terms of infrastructure? So this is actually something that we've been fighting on um, at the ground level. You know, our theory of change, and I, and I want to say a collective we, um, our theory of change is that we really need to ground ourselves in these bigger counties that are demographically shifting and hold the most votes. So there's really a set of nine counties that are really the roadmap to winning Texas um, that are priorities where we need to be focusing our organizing. And so groups like Move Texas and Texas Freedom Network, Battleground Texas, Texas Civil Rights Project, We've actually been working together in coalition around preparing, pr particularly in the pandemic, to really um, make sure that our local elections administrators are prepared. And so the reason why that mailing is happening is because we were on that commissioner's mm -hmm. court hearing and we had leaders there demanding that those, those ballots go out um, to folks and that people be given the instruction that they need and the access that they need. Because our folks probably don't have printers and who has a stamp these days, right? So we wanted to make that process as easy as possible and give them at their doorstep the information that they need. I mean, it's a little bit of a hodgepodge, I would say, across the state, um, you know, because we have no real leadership that's about really getting people to vote, but instead suppressing the vote, we've got to take it piecemeal. Um, and so um, I think that, you know, in, in those counties, though, of Dallas and Bear County and Harris County, they know that the eyes of the community are watching them and they're also really willing to be in partnership with us. And so as, you know, top, we're going to be targeting um, 1.6 million voters across the state, 800,000 Latinos through our program. And in the program that we're running, um, we're going to be talking to them, not just about what issues are important to them those down ballot candidates that are going to fight for them, but also asking them questions constantly of like, do you have what you need to vote? Do you have your voter ID? You know, are you sick or is somebody in your family vulnerable and might you qualify for a vote by mail? We give them that information through those conversations. So quick last question for the both of you. What do you foresee is going to be the defining element of the Latino electorate in this 2020 election? Uh, Crystal, I'll, I'll start with you and, and go to Maria Teresa. I'm sorry, can you repeat it one more time? <laughs> Just so. Sure. What, you know, what is the one defining element of the Latino electorate for the election? Is it going to be increased turnout? Um, is it going to be drive from, from one particular issue? What is kind of that one take home for you about the Latino electorate in this in this election? I think it's it's increased turnout and we're going to show up in huge numbers. We've been increasing our numbers in Texas over every cycle. There are half a million more registered Latinos in this state. And every time we're increasing our vote share, we're increasing our percentage turnout of our registered population and our voter registration numbers. And so turnout is going to be that key defining factor. And it's because we know it's at stake. And we're going we're gonna to have our voice heard because we know that we as individuals are going to save ourselves. 
And that's going to be our message um, in this election. So just briefly, I always say that the, that the Latino community, we're woke and we're awoken. And we are going to come out in record numbers. Our job is to close the voter registration gap and to do the things the way we always have to. No one's going to come to save us. We are the peace in our lives. And we're going to have to organize ourselves because people still have counted us out. And I haven't. All right. We heard it here. Texas. Uh, pivotal in this election, we're going to see some monumental change, perhaps a tsunami of change with the Latino vote. Thank you, Maria Teresa. Thank you, Crystal. Thank you for tuning in. Thanks for and we'll catch you next year at the Trip Fest. <laughs> Thank you.